For the last nine months, I've been busy building this, a series of scratch-built sci-fi models that tell the stories of this planet, Aegis, a world consumed by a mysterious fungus and teeming with otherworldly creatures and machines. But while I've built plenty of droids and aliens out of things like Nerf guns, Q-tips, clay, and foam, there's one kind of diorama I've completely avoided, an indoor scene. Can it be done? Let's find out. This is Gamey Builds, and welcome to Beyond the Blight. If you're joining me after the previous video, you might be wondering if I'll be narrating another short story to accompany this build, and the answer is yes, though I'll be saving it for the final part of this build video. The first step was to get started on the room's walls, for which I'm using this 1 inch XPS foam. Because I wanted this room to be highly detailed and realistic, I went through the effort of determining the scale beforehand, something I rarely do. With the walls cut out, I then measured out the rows of bricks, which in my case ended up each being one fourth of an inch high. I then scored the foam along these rows. Something vital to keep in mind here is that you want a very sharp blade whenever you're cutting foam, otherwise the soft material will tear and chip. That step was then repeated going vertically down the walls to create the spaces between the bricks. I also wanted a doorway, then widened all of the gaps between the bricks using this clay sculpting knife. This dental tool was then used to repeat that step for the vertical grooves, and also to press some of the bricks back to give a recessed look. Don't ask me why I own dental tools. And no, I'm definitely not performing root canals as a side hustle in this tumultuous economy. Although if you're on a budget and looking for filling, shoot me a DM. To further distress the wall, some teeth, I mean bricks, were removed with tweezers. The door then came out, and then the whole wall was bumpified with aluminum foil. For the stairs, I built everything out of wood, using these square 1 4th inch pine dowels for the frame, and these tongue depressors for the cross planks. By the way, I'm using tacky glue here, which is like white glue, but a lot thicker and stickier. For a handrail, I'm repurposing this roll cage from a dollar store final faction car toy, along with some acrylic tubes to make up for the missing length. Garage sale hunting is a favorite pastime of mine because nothing creeps out my neighbors more than a grown man buying power tools and duct tape and children's toys, like this probably antique fire engine which donated its hydraulic arm to my workshop. A bit of styrene helped to alter the shape a bit, but I didn't get too crazy with it. The Nerf gun I hacked up for my Chisel Homic build a couple videos back was put to further use here to become a wall-mounted console. The original idea was that the crane arm would attach to this, but as you'll soon see, that idea didn't quite pan out as I'd hoped. This is a G.I. Joe's quiver full of arrows, by the way, and it reminds me of just how much your brain has to rewire itself to learn how to kitbash like this. I think of it like learning to draw, where you have to first learn how to see the world around you in shapes, values, lines, and negative and positive space. Kit bashing is like that, paying attention to detail, texture, and form, while ignoring things that can be changed, like position and color. I guess what I'm trying to say is that kit bashing is like drawing, just less anchored to reality and thus more mentally destabilizing. Case in point, this is more action figure bits superglued to a graphite container for mechanical pencils, and will become a control panel for a massive security door, which I'll be building next out of this one millimeter chipboard. It's important to note that the footage you've seen up till now was filmed over an entire week of building. By their very nature, videos here on YouTube tend to gloss over the tedium involved in their production. 10 seconds of video can represent dozens of hours of work or more, leaving viewers with the intentional impression that art is easier to create than it really is. But while it's true that building these dioramas has gotten somewhat easier in some respects as I've gained experience, 
and slowly built a more robust collection of tools and supplies, there's never a build that's stress-free. It's tempting as a video creator to cut that stuff out for the sake of retaining viewers, but I think it's important to mention. If you're thinking of getting into building your own dioramas or really doing anything artistic or creative, be ready to work and fail and learn. Be resilient about your craft and with time, you will get the results. After making this tiny hanging shelf from some leftover toy bits and a tongue depressor, it was time to create the books. Now, I probably didn't need to do this next step since the books would be so small that you'd never be able to see the writing on the covers, but for an added layer of realism, I designed these book covers in Photoshop with titles in the Ajizian language. This one says Hidami, a historical book about the blight, while this one is about Tet, simple machines. For the book's paper inserts, I used a variety of methods, but I found that the best results came from using cheap catalogs printed on newsprint paper. Once the book covers were glued on at the spine, the newsprint could be easily sliced. Other book covers were made from various paper products, like these grocery bags and assorted mail flyers. Once the books were glued and dry, I weathered them all with brown and black acrylic washes. The fancier books even got a gold trim. Once the washes had dried, I glued the open ends of the books together so that they'd sit evenly on the shelf. And remember me mentioning mistakes just a second ago? Well, a prime example of one was this workbench. As cool of an aesthetic as it was, with its raised drafting table and drawers, it was way too big for the rest of the diorama, so I scrapped it and started over. Fortunately, it was around this time that I received this shipment of miniature die-cast tools from a supplier in China. I'd totally forgotten that one of the items I'd ordered was this mini freezer, which, after some small alterations, made for a pretty convincing workbench. I also replaced the plastic in one of the doors with this metal mesh, and while it wasn't used here like I intended, don't worry, it won't go to waste. It was about this time when I was feeling a little burnt out on super gluing and kit bashing, so I decided to take a break from the monotony by carving a stone floor out of foam, and holy cow was that the wrong remedy for tedium. This diagonal trough for a drainage grate was alright, and actually kind of satisfying if I'm honest. And these pavers were okay, but these stones, oh my goodness. I've no idea why I expected this would be easier than the brick walls, because in the end it took me several days just to delineate all the shapes. And once that was done, I gave them more dimension by smoothing out the edges with an eraser. Then came the usual texturing with foil. With all the crafting done, it was time for the fun part. Painting is by far my favorite process of these builds. It's where everything really comes together, and the diorama becomes more than the sum of its parts. I started with the brick walls, laying down some brown acrylic paint as a base before going over individual bricks in various reds, browns, and tans. Some bricks got only a single layer of paint, while others were painted multiple times, creating even more variation in color. I then sprinkled plaster powder over everything, being sure to brush it into the cracks and holes before spraying on some water and diluted white glue to lock it all in place. To bring back some of the detail, I added this black wash, which helped give the impression of depth. Once both walls were finished, it was time to move on to the floor. 
Now, I wanted the colors to differ from the brick walls with more gray, so I went for this brownish gray base coat, not worrying too much about mixing the colors as I welcomed the variation. Then, using a similar technique as the walls, I brushed on grays and browns to individual stones. The plaster was then sprinkled on, though this time I sprayed the whole thing in a black wash to make sure the grout between the stones was nice and dark. Finally, some watered-down green paint helped create the look of damp, mossy stones near the water drain. A few months ago, these decorative lights at Daiso caught my eye. I originally thought they were all white, as that was the picture on the packaging, but I found some interesting ways to make the colors here work for the diorama. I've had this old laptop computer fan in a box for over a year, and finally found a permanent home for it in this build. After cutting a hole in one of the walls, then screening it off, I glued the fan to the back, making for an interesting added detail, especially when a red LED light was stuck inside. Then it was off to painting the many details of the interior, some of which I built off camera, like this unassembled droid. Since the painting process for many of these items is more or less the same, I'll let the footage roll while we get into the short story behind the build. You are watching Gamey Builds. Thank you, and enjoy the blight. I first met Almira shortly after my recruitment into the engineering guild of the Corsecchi family. Like the other royals, the Corsecchi family's power was born from its bloodline, but maintained through industry. In their case, that meant swallowing up the local factories one by one, until they had eventually monopolized production across the equator. Almira worked in the Corsecchi genetics lab a high-demand field at a time when we still believed we had a chance of reversing the blight. She was kind and patient with me whenever I'd arrive at their lab, fumbling to repair an air scrubber or replace parts on a lab droid. It was tiresome, thankless work, but Elmira made it bearable. She was the sole beacon of light in that cold and sterile lab. Within five years of my arrival, we were married, and I'd completed my apprenticeship. I was moved to the droid division of the engineers. Almira and I saw each other less after that, and I suspect that was by design. Within a decade, the Corsecchi power was waning. Precious resources were being squandered on skirmishes between them and the Ekra family. The region's infrastructure was suffering. All the while, the blight was gradually chewing up large swaths of land. Infected fields could no longer produce food. Lowlands bogged down by heavy rains became wretched, uninhabitable swamps teeming with brackish water and mutated species. As unsure as our future on this planet was, Almira and I kept hope alive of one day starting our own family of perhaps currying enough favor with the House of Kurseki to be granted passage to a colony moon or a satellite base. We sought to make ourselves indispensable. The tide turned when a recruiter arrived one day with a royal summons. I was interviewed by the stewards of the house. They stressed the secrecy of the project I'd be assigned to. Beyond the walls of my workshop, no one was to learn of what we were building. I complied, as if I had a choice. Our task, as it turned out, was to design a droid sentience for military use. This was not simply a Corsecchi version of the Iron Claw, a military bot from the northern region. They were strong and fierce, but ultimately stupid. The Corsecchi family wanted a droid that could be cunning. Moreover, it would be linked to a neural network of similar droids, creating a powerful hive mind. I had misgivings about this technology, 
but what could I do? Along with a team of programmers, chippers, and other droid engineers, I got to work. Almira had many questions about my secretive new assignment. I said nothing. It was not that I felt any allegiance toward the house of Corsecchi. I simply feared for our family's future. Whatever versions of history survive into the next century, I doubt any will accurately convey the ruthlessness of the Corsecchi Empire. But Almira's curiosity was insatiable. She noted the microfluid on my sleeves one day and thus determined I was still working on droids. Another time she ran into a programmer who happened to mention me, and another piece of the puzzle fell into place. She was a geneticist after all. Her mind excelled at working out codes and puzzles. When she finally figured it out, she was furious. I came home that evening to a house in disarray. A pot of something hot and sticky was burning on the stove and a layer of smoke clung to our ceiling. I can't believe you would do this, Tack, Almira said. I asked what she meant. These droids you're building, this will be the end of us. You must be careful, Amira, I said, trying to calm her. Whatever you know, you must forget it. Did you ever wonder why this project of theirs is so secretive? Did you ever stop and think? She demanded. I had nothing to say. How much more power can a family want? They already track their subjects' DNA. They punish runaways and dissidents with sterility, wiping out future generations while thinning the gene pool. And now they want a droid army capable of outthinking us? What will be left when they are finished? I had no alternative, Amira. Had I refused their offer, I know, I know, she said, cutting me off. I walked over to our stove and removed the ruined dinner. When this is done, Tack, they will abandon us, Amira said in a voice more defeated than anything I'd heard her speak in prior. All these promises of a better life off-world, I'm beginning to think they're just fantasies propagated to keep us marching. And what happens when you succeed? What happens when you begin designing sentient scientists? They've already replaced much of the labor force. You're working towards our obsolescence. I tried to smile reassuringly. Ultimately, they cannot sustain this production for much longer. They may get their army, but at this rate of consumption, there will be little left for further development. Already there are whispers of factories shutting down. Time is running out. And no droid built by human hands could ever replace the brilliant geneticist I see before me, I said. I'm glad that I spoke those words when I did, because it was the last time that I would see Almira. She was arrested the next day at the lab, along with a handful of other geneticists for reasons undisclosed. I'm sure they would have executed her had it not been for you, our child, with whom she was only a month pregnant. Neither of us had known at the time. It was bittersweet, knowing that I would be a father to a child I would surely raise on my own. But Almira's instructions were clear. She wanted you raised far away from this place. You are a week old at the time of this recording, but you will be 13 when you finally hear it. Were I to delay any longer in enacting my plan, the neonatologists would arrive and install your gene tracker, placing you forever under Corsecchi surveillance. I put you in good hands. This droid is a robust logistics model and has trekked over the entire continent. Its programming has been altered significantly to account for any dangers it might face in its journeys. It will keep you fed, warmed, and protected on your way to the Fis Alim Science Outpost, one of the few corners of the globe where the Corsecchi Empire wields no power. And when you are of age, this faithful droid will replay this message for you. You are not to worry about me 
or come looking for me. I will claim that my newborn child died without the care of its mother and live whatever years I have left knowing that a piece of a mirror lives on. You are the heart beating outside of my own body. Your father, Tech. Thank you all so much for watching, and a very special thank you to my lovely patrons who've been following this build on Patreon for the last month, giving their input and helping to keep me motivated. Let me know what you thought of this build and the story in the comments, and tell me what you'd like to see next from Beyond the Blight. Until next time, this is Gamey Builds, over and out.